How many times do you hear people say, oh my God? And yet so many people, as I think you would know, have no comprehension, no understanding of what they mean when they say God. A.W. Tozer has always remarked that the most important thing about us as, as individuals and as a nation is our view and our understanding of God, of who God is, what He's like. He wrote this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That being so, let me ask you, what comes into your mind when you think of God? Or perhaps even better, the Bible talks about the eyes of our heart. With the eyes of your heart, how do you see Him? How do you perceive and understand who God is? Tozer goes on to say this, wrong ideas about God are not only the fountain from which the polluted waters of idolatry flow, they are themselves idolatrous. The idolater simply imagines things about God and then imagines them to be true. Notice that line. He imagines things about God and then imagines them to be true. For example, someone might say, I just can't believe that a God of love would ever, ever send someone to eternal hell. They imagine that and then believe it to be true. Or someone might say, I cannot believe that the good things that I have done, the the people that I have helped, the giving, the support that I have extended to others. I can't believe God isn't going to say to me that I'm a good person and I should be given the right of going to heaven on my own merit. A lot of people like that. A lot of people. They imagine this to be true and then they live as if it is true. One more statement from Tozer He says, the heaviest obligation lying upon the Christian church today is to purify and elevate her concept of God until it is worthy of him and of us. We do the greatest service to the next generation of Christians by passing on to them an undimmed and undiminished and noble concept of God. Well, there's no question in my mind that what Tozer is talking about here is absolutely true. And so what I would like to do with you this morning, both this morning and next week, I'd like to walk you through a biblical understanding of God, even though it's impossible to know Him fully. I mean, that stands to reason. How can... How can finite people such as we are understand infinite. Uh, There will be a breakdown somewhere along the way. C.S. Lewis said, all theology of God is in fact a luminous blur anyway. And yet, we can know enough about God to see Him in His majesty, in His exalted and majestic state. We can know enough about God to see the wisdom of our obedience to Him. We can know God well enough to fully trust Him with our lives, to see the wisdom of John 14, 6, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let me show you this, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, 
that we may observe all the words of this law. If you would, notice there are secret things that are known only to God. For example, how does God create something out of nothing? We can't understand that. How does God condescend and and take on human flesh to be born in Bethlehem's manger? Uh, How does God uh, put his son on the cross and then impute to his son all of the sin of humanity? How does that work out? How do you understand that? I can't. I accept it as fact because I believe God, but we can't begin to understand all that God does. On the other hand, God has given us what he calls revealed things. What are revealed things? Well, that's what this is all about. This book is, in fact, the very revelation of God. God revealing himself. Infinite is revealing something of himself to people finite as we are. And there is enough right here in this Bible to help us understand what we need to know about God. And there is enough here to help us have a strong confidence and a strong faith in him And most of all, to be able to have confidence and hope in him irregardless of circumstances or obstacles we may be confronted with. I mean, one of the beautiful things about being a believer is that wherever you are, God offers you a door of hope. Even when you are breathing your last, it's not over. There is a door for you, the door of hope, and God is offering us that door in a continuous fashion. Now, this morning I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the existence of God because the Bible teaches the existence of God is something that is self-evident. There are things in life that are self-evident. We hold these truths to be, um, how does it go, that all men are created we, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, our Declaration of Independence. Uh, there are things in life that are self-evident, that you should never take another life. That's self-evident. I think uh, taking the life of even an unborn child is wrong and self-evident, although people today don't want to hear that. There are things in life that are self-evident, and the Bible assumes the existence of God to be self-evident. Look at this in Romans 1, 19, 20. Paul is talking about uh, pagan humanity. He says they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the word was, world was created, through forever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. God is simply saying there is enough evidence in creation itself to take away any and every excuse of mankind for not believing, for not knowing God. Psalm 19 speaks of this issue. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make Him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. And so he's saying the message of creation is that God is there. Francis Schaeffer wrote a book entitled The God Who Is There. He is there and he is not silent. That was the name of the book. Uh, 
And so I'm saying all of that to say I'm taking it for granted that you have no problems with the existence of God. My guess is that's not an issue with you. If it is an issue, let me recommend go to your computer, go to YouTube, and type in the name William Lane Craig, or type in the name Ravi Zacharias, and there are others. These are are men who are carrying the torch, debating atheists all over the world, and really doing an admirable job in communicating the truth about the existence of God. These men have intellects that are just profound and amazing, and I recommend them to you. That said, and that aside, what I want to do this morning is talk about God in terms of his nature and his character. My view is this is an area where we are weak, and it's an area that we need to know and understand better. Theologians refer to this as the essence of God. Essence is the being that is attributed to God, the being. And so the way we understand the being of God is by his attributes. What is an attribute? An attribute, very simply, is something that is true about God. In fact, let me be clear to clarify, an an attribute is not being defined as a part of God. For example, the Bible says God is love. Well, that doesn't mean that God has the capacity to love. That simply means that God, his entire nature is love. Everything that he does everything that he thinks, every action on his part is filtered through that nature of divine love. And so that said, let me give you these four attributes to consider this morning. Omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, and immutability. And by the way, thinking along these lines... Uh, The other day, I thought about the Romans in the world of the first century. They had a whole pantheon of deities. They had a pantheon of gods. They were polytheistic, we would say today, meaning they worshipped many gods. And, And the way they would develop their gods is they would take things that are important to them in this life, thoughts and ideas, And then they would take those thoughts and ideas and put a deity behind it. So there is the sun. That's pretty important. Let's let's worship the God of the sun. Uh, Let me show you this. There is Zeus. Zeus is known as the king of all gods. The Romans called Zeus Jupiter. The Greeks called him Zeus. So I'll give you a listing of them. On the left, you have the Greek meaning or statement of the name of this particular God. And then next to that, in brackets, will be the Roman uh, way of stating their, their God, their particular God. For example, Pluto, and then his Roman name was Juno. He was the god of sky and thunder. Then Venus, who was Aphrodite to the Romans, the goddess of love. Of course, uh, it was a perverted form of love that they're uh, in reference to. Neptune, Poseidon, you remember the Poseidon adventure? Uh, The god of the sea, Artemis, uh, is in Acts chapter 18. The goddess Diana, uh, the goddess of the hunt. Then there's Mars, the god of war. Eros, uh, the Romans called Eros Cupid, the god of love. Nike, (laughs) the Greek uh, word for the goddess of victory. The Romans called uh, this particular deity Victoria. So here's what I'm trying to say. These are not really gods. There are no other gods. It's only that unsaved men believe that there are. 
If you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, what you will find is that behind these, these ideas of deities, there is actually a demonic presence. Read it yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There is one God and one God alone. Now, <clears throat> that said, let me walk you through these four attributes. The first one being the idea of God's omnipotence, which simply means God is all-powerful. Uh, the biblical name for God that, that tags along with this idea is El Shaddai. El Shaddai means God Almighty. God is Almighty. Look at the verse on the screen. Verse 17, Jeremiah 32. He says, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Why is that so? Because God is omnipotent. Let me give you this as a definition here. Omnipotence. Omnipotence is the ability of God to act in accordance with his perfect nature and desire, and there is nothing capable of ever holding him back. Nothing. In fact, let me tell you something. God never sweats. God doesn't sweat. God never feels anything of a challenge coming against him or struggle in any way. I mean, think about that. There's a lot of things that we would like to be able to do and we would like to be able to achieve in our life, but we can't because of our ignorance and our inadequacy. We just don't know enough and we can't act it out. We can't accomplish because we don't have the power. However, that is not true of God. Nothing opposes God. Nothing can deter him from what he wants to do. And what he will do, folks, get this, is always in accordance with his righteous nature. In other words, God's Power will never violate who he is in other ways. And so in this sense, there are some things you could say that God cannot do. For example, God cannot annihilate himself because he is eternal. He is unchanging. He cannot lie because he is absolute truth. He cannot go back on his word because he is forever faithful. He cannot be tempted. He is absolute holiness, self-sufficient, and needs nothing. God doesn't need us, and yet he calls us to himself so that he can give to us and bless us. God needs nothing. He, he is utterly self-sufficient. So God cannot be tempted, nor cannot... Can, God cannot be imperfect. Sin is imperfection. You see what I'm saying? God is all-powerful, but he, he demonstrates his power always through the context of his true nature. And in that sense, Jesus says, with God, everything is possible. Matthew 19, 26. And that's because he is omnipotent. Now, I realize the word omnipotent, that's not a word that we would use in our everyday conversation, but the truth is, if you boil the term down to a simpleton like me, what it means is God can do it, whatever it is, and God is able. He is able. And that really is what we need to remember in terms of application. God is able. God is omnipotent. God is able. That means I can pray for the impossible to take place because of who we're calling out to. 
I can pray for the impossible. It also means that even though I'm weak in myself, I can be made strong in him. And even though Satan himself is so much more powerful than I, and I'm certainly no match for him, and yet, according to the Lord, when I am in a covenant relationship with him and I have the indwelling of the Spirit, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Let me tell you something. Satan is no match for a believer filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the wisdom of God, and walking in the light of God's grace. Satan can only trip us up if we buy into his lies or begin to act independently from our Lord. Now, the second attribute of God we need to remember is what is called the omnipresence of God. Omni, remember, means all, the all presence of God. Uh, This term means that God transcends all limits of space and time. In other words, God is never confined to a particular place alone. He simply is not confined to a particular place. Theologians put it this way. There is no place in creation where God does not exist and exist in all of his fullness. And so I think you can see the point of omnipresence is that God is always there. No matter where you are, he is there. He's here, but he's also everywhere else. Look at this, Psalm 139. Where can I go? Verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol or Hades, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. Jeremiah chapter 23, am I God who is only Am I a God who is only close at hand, says the Lord? No, I am far away at the same time. Verse 24, can anyone hide from me in a secret place? Am I not everywhere in all the heavens and the earth, says the Lord? Look at this, Proverbs 15, verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every Place keeping watch on the evil and the good. This means that we are never out of God's presence. God always knows where we're at. And he can legitimately say in that sense, I will never leave you or forsake you. We can know that to be true because of his omnipresence. Attribute number three is the omniscience of God. Omni, remember, means all. The omniscience of God speaks of the all-knowing of God, the all-wise nature of God. Look at this in Psalm 147, verse 5. It says, Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite infinite. Because of this uh, amazing understanding of God, Jesus is able to say that God the Father sees even the smallest sparrow that falls to the ground. And God is able to know the hair on your head at any given moment. Isn't that amazing? I don't think it's like God is actually counting our, the hairs on our head because it's changing all the time. It's simply an idiom to let us know that God knows us fully, 
completely. He knows us in every imaginable way. Look at this statement, Romans eleven thirty three. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Now, to illustrate this, God, God not only knows where I am, he knows not only those things that have happened in my life, but he knows the things that will happen in my life, and he knows the things that could or would happen. Look at this, Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. By the way, it's important to realize Satan does not read your thoughts. He can read you, but he is not omniscient. He doesn't know your thought life. He can read you. We, we're pretty good at reading people. We can figure out what's going on just by looking at people in a lot of, uh, of cases. But the, the point that I, I'm just trying to get across is only God can understand your very thoughts. Look at verse 3. David says of God, you scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Look at this in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 8. Remember this and be assured. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Notice, my my will I will accomplish, and my good pleasure I will carry out. God says, I will do this, and he can say that and fulfill it because he's omniscient, he's, he's omnipotent, and he is omnipresent. Now, I want you to consider this with me. Omniscience, omniscience means God knows what was. It means God knows what is, God knows what shall be, and God knows what could be. Now, <clears throat> I'm saying this for a particular reason. You can count on the fact whenever you place your full trust in God, in other words, whenever you surrender your whole life to Him, when you say, Lord, here's my past, Here's my present, and I give you my future. When you say, Lord, I have decided to live my whole life for you and for your glory, I am trusting you, Lord, to determine who I am, to determine what my career will be, to determine who I will uh, marry, to determine where I will live, where I will be, how I use my time, etc. When you give your total self to God because He knows all the factors and all of the possibilities and because He loves you and I more than we could ever imagine, then you can be very sure that God's choice is going to be the very best that you can achieve in this life. That gives me such comfort because I know that I am achieving and experiencing the very best that God has for me in this life. And you might say, that isn't much, Bill, but you don't know where I came from. You don't know where I would be 
if I made choices to live my own life on my own terms. And the same is true for you. You can trust God because He loves you. He knows all of the choices. He will take you down the road of making the right choice, and you will experience the very best that God can give you in this life. That, to me, is truly amazing and comforting. Now, <clears throat> one other important attribute, and I'll finish, and that is the attribute of immutability. Immutability simply means God does not change. And this is, needless to say, so important for us to understand. Malachi 3.6, For I, the Lord, do not change. I do not change, therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed, because I do not change. Look at this in Psalm 102. Of old you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment. He's talking about the second law of thermodynamics, right? Everything is winding down coming to nothing eventually. All of them, all of them will wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not come to an end. And then in Hebrews 13.8, a verse most of us are well acquainted with, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what this means to us in terms of application is that the integrity of God will never change for believers. This means that His promises will always remain intact for us, irregardless of how we feel about a given issue or circumstance in our life. The promises of God will always be there. It means His plans and purposes for us are not going to change. Look at this. Psalm 33, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, as does His word, I might say. In Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Look at this in Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And 10,000 years from tonight or today, the word of God is still going to remain intact forever and ever. Now, here's what's interesting. You take this idea of the immutability of God, that God does not change, and blend it with the other attributes of God. And it begins to help you understand amazing things. It it means that God's power will never diminish. His omniscience and His knowledge will never uh, wind down. Uh, He is eternal, so He always will be. And His love for believers who have a covenant relationship with him through Christ, we can be sure that his love will never quit. We can never, Paul said, be separated from the love of God in Christ. Jeremiah 31.3 says that God's love for us is an everlasting love. And so I think you can see then that immutability becomes the ground of God's faithfulness to us. I know we talk all the time about our faithfulness and it's important, but have you ever considered and thought about the faithfulness of God to you? I love this passage in Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Without wavering, it's my observation that way too many believers are wavering back and forth in their walk with God. Have you ever noticed that? Paul is saying, let's 
Let's hold fast our profession of faith. Do you have a profession of faith? Was there and is there a time, moment, was there a moment in your life when you turned your back on your past and you embraced Jesus on the basis of the gospel and you received him into your life as your Savior? Do you have a profession of faith? He is faithful who made promises to you, and he will continue to be faithful to you. But it's important now that we don't waver back and forth. We hold fast our profession. Let me show you this, and I'm done. This is Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom... Let not the mighty man glory in his might, let, or, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. He's talking about human boasting in wisdom, in might, in riches. These are the things that people talk about in American culture. You watch movies, and these are the things that are always being exalted. Riches, power, wisdom, ability. Look at this. Don't let him boast in these things, but let him glory. Let him who glories or him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. Not only that he knows me, but that he understands. Do you see that? I I know a lot of believers who have come into a relationship with our Lord, and that's great, but they don't go on to deepen their understanding of who God is. And what the Lord is saying, if you want to boast, boast in this, that you understand and know me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness judgment or justice and righteousness in the earth for in these things I delight says the Lord you can be sure that if you'll trust him and rest in him in your coming to know him that God will fulfill every promise that he makes I love this old hymn great is thy faithfulness O God my father There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. That's the God that we're giving ourselves to. My prayer is that you've done it and that you're growing now to understand who he is. Let's pray. Guys. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for being able to help us understand who you are. The more we know of you, the better we are able to trust you, to rely upon you. And I pray, God, that you would help each of us today to assess where we're at And help us to begin from this day forward to deepen our knowledge of of you, of who you are. God, may you bless us with illumination by the Holy Spirit so that we can know the greatness and the majesty of our God. I pray that you would help us, Father. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.